Cool. We're there. So, hi everyone. Um, my name's Michelle. Um, I'm a front end developer at MUD, a digital agency based in Bath. And today I want to talk about CSS Grid and CSS variables or custom properties, which are two relatively new specs which are really shaking things up in the CSS world right now and have got me pretty excited about web design and development. So I'm going to start with CSS Grid, or the CSS Grid Layout Module Level 1, to give it its full title. So how many of you are already using CSS Grid or have started using it a little bit? OK, that's a, more than half of you. That's really good. Um, so I'm going to cover a few of the CSS Grid basics for those of you who aren't using it just yet. Um, but hopefully, for those of you who are pretty comfortable with it, there'll be a few useful things um, a little bit later on in the talk as well, and hopefully earlier on in the talk. Who knows? Um, so what's exciting about CSS Grid? Um, well, it's the first specification we've really had that's actually designed for two-dimensional layout. Um, this question comes up quite a lot. Uh, why not just use Flexbox? Well, a lot of existing grid systems out there use Flexbox, and I've been, I've been using Flexbox for quite a while to code layout because it's really kind of the best thing that we've had available to us until now. Flexbox is great at what it does, which is allowing us to define a one-dimensional layout. But CSS Grid is different. It allows us to define a two-dimensional space, and it allows us complete control of our layouts. So with grids, new layouts are possible that we've never really seen on the web before um, and that have never really been possible without using JavaScript. Um, Jen Simmons, who is one of the key players in the CSS grid world and has done a lot of work towards uh, getting the spec implemented and supported um, and teaching people about grid, has coined the term intrinsic web design um, to kind of describe the next evolutionary stage from responsive design, um, which CSS Grid is enabling us to produce. So in, with intrinsic web design, uh, rather than having the kind of old responsive design patterns where we're just kind of stacking things as we um, get to smaller viewports, intrinsic web design is a bit more fluid. We might have some fixed track sizes and some flexible tracks, and we can make things collapse and expand at different rates. It really allows a kind of more nuanced approach to layout. And I think that's pretty exciting, and I'm really excited to see what's going to be produced over the next few years. Uh, before I carry on, I just want to refer to some of the terminology I'm going to be using in this talk. So a grid is a container element uh, with the display property set to grid. And uh, that is the container onto which we're placing our items. So it's one HTML element. Any direct children of that grid can be grid items. Tracks, I'm referring to rows and columns. And cells are the places where row and column tracks intersect. So they are the smallest unit um, onto which we can place an item. And grid areas are more groups of more than one cell in a rectangular area, um, so somewhere we, where we might want to place an item spanning multiple rows or tracks. Um, gutters are the uh, kind of so the grid the gaps between tracks are commonly referred to as gutters. They're actually described by the grid column gap and grid row gap properties. So let's define our first grid. We have um, a selector with a class of grid. We're setting that as display grid, as we've already seen. And we're using grid, templ grid template columns and grid template rows to describe our grid. Um, in this case, we're producing a um, four column by four row layout. Um, and each column has a fixed track size of 200 pixels wide. And each row has a fixed height of 150 pixels. And just one note about my slides here. At the bottom right-hand corner of each slide, um, I'm including links to relevant demos. Um, I'll publish these slides afterwards if anyone wants to kind of dig into the code a little bit more. As we've already seen, the grid column gap and grid row gap properties um, give us our gutters, which are both 20 pixels in this case. So we have a grid that looks a little bit like this. 
but it's not responsive yet. And if we jump back to the code, uh, there's quite a lot of repetition there. So we can cut down on that a little bit. So first of all, we can use the repeat function. So we have four tracks of equal size on both the column axis and the row axis. So the repeat function takes two arguments. The first one is the number of tracks, and the second one is the track size. So we have uh, four tracks, 200 pixels wide, and four is it, row tracks, 150 pixels high. We can also use the shorthand grid template, um, which is fine to do here. We have quite a short grid declaration. This keeps our, our code a bit more concise. Um, but um, some, I don't tend to do this too much, because some of the grid declarations can get quite long and wordy. Um, so personally, I find it's easier to keep grid template rows and grid template columns separate. But um, you know, it completely depends on the project. We can also use grid gap as the shorthand for grid row gap and grid column gap. Um, so uh, in this case, because it's, both, it's the same in both directions, I can just use 30 pixels. So the next thing we can do to make our grid responsive is we can use flexible units instead of fixed track sizing. Um, and here I'm using the FR unit, which is a new unit exclusive to grid. Um, and what that does is it allows us to define tracks that take up a proportion of the available space, um, taking things like gutters into account. Um, so with grid, there actually really isn't much need anymore to use percentage sizes and calc, um, because the FR unit does a lot of the heavy lifting for us. So this grid will be four columns, each taking up an equal proportion of the available space. Uh, just to give you an example of that in action, if we have three columns, each of those 200 pixels wide, and one column, um, which is one FR unit, we get something like this. So the first three columns are fixed width, and the fourth column is taking up all of the remaining space. So in grid, we can define explicit tracks, which are defined with our grid template rows and grid template columns properties. And we can also define Im implicit tracks. Um, so we can do this with grid auto rows and grid auto columns. And sometimes you don't know the number of, of items you want to place in your layout. So you don't know how many tracks your grid needs. For example, if you're creating like a news feed, um, you might be wanting to add items into that all the time. You don't, know, you don't know how long that's going to be. So grid auto rows allows us to define the height of any newly created tracks, which are created when we, when we place items onto our grid. Um, the default value for that is auto. So in some cases, we may want to set it, we may not. Um, probably a news feed is not a great example, because quite often you might want to make those rows the height of your content. But if you have like an Im image gallery, for example, uh, you might want to create um, each of those new rows at a fixed size. So this is what our grid looks like, but it's actually invisible, um, because it hasn't got any content in it yet. You can inspect it in the browser. Um, and I recommend Firefox DevTools for doing that, um, which were also partly developed by Jen Simmons. Um, and that allows us to kind of inspect the grid and see sort of where, where items are placed, which tracks they're on, and that kind of thing. It has a really good grid inspector. There are a few different ways to place items on our grid. This is our basic markup that we're using. So we have a div with a class of grids, and we have three child items. The first way we can place items is with auto-placement. And if we don't do anything further, those items will be auto-placed. So they will just take up the first three available cells. And sometimes that's desirable behavior, um, like the newsfeed example that I mentioned. But let's imagine we want to build a simple page layout. So we have similar markup again. We have a div with a class of grid, and we have three child items. In this case, a header, a main element, and an aside. And now we're going to place those items by grid line. 
the grid lines are numerical lines that sit between each track, and we can reference these numbers to place items on the grid. So in this case, we're placing our header using the grid column start and grid column end properties. So starting at, column, at, at line one and ending at line five, which gives us this. Uh, we don't need to use um, grid row start and grid row end because those grid items will automatically take up one track unless we otherwise define them. We can also place our main and a side elements in a similar way, and in this case, we do need to use grid row start and grid row end because they're going to take up more than one track. So that gives us the layout we want. But the code, again, is quite long and wordy. We can make this more concise. The grid column is the shorthand for grid column start and grid column end, and likewise with grid, grid row. That would be grid row start and grid row end. So that makes our code a bit shorter. With our aside elements, we don't actually need to place that by grid column because that is the only available column. So it will be auto-placed in that column. But we do need to define how many rows we want it to take up. And here I'm using the span keyword instead of an end line. Um, so with the span keyword, I can just say, I want this item to span two rows, and I don't need to specify a start line and end line. And that's pretty useful. So just to run through some of the possible values for our grid column and grid row properties, we can have a start line and an end line. We could have uh, span and auto placement. So we just want it to span three columns. We can have a start line and span. And one thing to note here is if we placed it at grid line four and had a span of three, then that would generate implicit tracks on the column axis. So we would end up with more columns in our grid than we actually want, um, which in this case would just break our layout. We can also have span and an end line. And sometimes it's really useful to be able to place items by end line rather than start line. The other way that we can place items is by naming lines. Uh, so in this grid declaration, I have line names for header start, main start, main end, and header end, which on initial glance looks a little bit confusing if you're not that familiar with grid. But what I'm basically doing is this. I'm naming line one, header start, and main start, because that's where both of those elements start. I'm naming line four, main end, and I'm naming, naming line five, header end. Now, you can use any names for your lines, but if you suffix those name, line names with start and end, you get a grid area, which means we can do this. So we can just say, put our header in the header area, put our main in the main area, which is kind of nice. There's one more method of placing items that I want to mention, and that's using the grid template areas property. And this allows us to basically draw our grid with text. Um, so in this case, I'm using H for header, M for main, A for aside. For any blank cells, you can use a full stop or you can use a blank space. Um, and you can use, you don't need to use single letters, you can use full words, so header or main or, you know, uh, triangle. I mean, it won't be a triangle, that's a stupid example. <laughs> <laughs> that was literally the first word that came into my head. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you can call them whatever you want. You can't call them numbers, as I found out to my detriment. Um, fun fact. Uh, so, this can be quite useful. Um, it's not something I tend to use super often. Uh, but for some people, this is kind of one of the major selling points of grid for them. And I can see why. Um, it does make things really clear where you need to position them. And then when it comes to placing our items, all we need to do is reference that area. Nice and easy. Now, onto CSS variables or custom properties. So I tend to refer to them as CSS variables, but uh, because to me, like, they behave a lot like variables in you know, SAS or JavaScript or whatever. Um, that kind of you know, adds up in my brain. Um, but I see them get more, referred to more and more now as custom properties, and I can kind of see why. So I think I might have to start calling them that as well. <laughs> 
So you're probably familiar with variables if you're using SAS um, or LESS or one of the preprocessors, but CSS variables are not the same as preprocessor variables. They can't be used interchangeably. So one of the big differences is SAS and LESS variables are compiled in the pre-processing stage before your code hits the browser. And CSS variables are computed in the browser, and that has implications for how we can use them. So CSS variables can't be used for selector names or media queries. They can only be used for CSS property values, and hence they're known as custom properties. CSS variables are dynamic variables. Um, so once they're set, their value isn't fixed. We can update them in CSS and JavaScript. To use a JavaScript analogy, preprocessor -processor, pre variables are a bit like const. So once you set them, uh, that's it. That's, that's what the variable is. Whereas CSS variables are a bit more like let. Uh, they can be reassigned. They can be scoped to a component or a selector. This is how we declare a variable. And I'm declaring this variable bg color on the root element, which is the equiv equivalent to the HTML element, but with higher specificity. Um, and this is creating a global variable. Um, you don't need to declare your variables on root. Um, sometimes it's a lot more useful to scope them to the selector. And this is how we use that variable in this component with the class of my component. So the background color of this component is going to be red. One thing that's really handy to do with CSS variables is to set defaults. So I'm giving this component, my component, a background color of BG color. But if that variable can't be found, for example, it's not been assigned yet, um, then the background color will be orange. And then if my component is the last child, um, I'm actually um, defining that variable BG color as red. So for the last child, the background color will be red. That's quite simple. There's a slightly better example here. So I have a box with which I'm doing exactly the same thing with. I'm saying I want this box to have a background color of BG color. If BG color can't be found, then I want it to be orange. And then in this purple selector, I'm assigning BG color a value of Rebecca purple. In the code on the left, if I just have a box on its own, it's going to be orange. In the code on the right, if I have a box inside this purple selector, it's going to be Rebecca purple, because I've scoped that variable to the purple selector. So now I'm going to talk about combining CSS variables with CSS grid. And variables can make complex layouts easier to manage. And the first way they can do that is by managing complex de grid declarations. This is a grid declaration that I wrote for a component um, that I built at MUD, the agency I work with. Um, it's for uh, Warner Brothers Studios, a project we worked on. Um, and as you can see, the grid template columns and grid template rows properties have got quite long. I'm using um, a, quite a few line names. Um, I'm also using, uh, it's a, also a 24 column grid, which is insane. No one should use 24 columns in their grids, in my opinion. <laughs> Um, I'm also using um, the min-max function, um, which I just want to kind of um, divert into a little bit. So min-max function is another really useful function in grid, and that basically does exactly what it says. Um, it allows you to define a minimum size and a maximum size for your tracks. And what this is doing here is I have 24 columns, um, which will have a minimum size of zero and a maximum size of 30 pixels. And they will basically form our central um, wrapper area. They'll grow to 30 pixels and no larger. Then I have a flexible column either side of that, um, which will um, expand to fill up all the available space in the viewport. And what that means is we can place items on that grid that align to a central wrapper that's being used throughout the site. And we can also place items that break out and fill the viewport or 
align to the edge of the viewport if we want to. Um, so that's super handy. Um, I also have a blog post on it. I can link to that in um, one of the later slides as well. So going back to how CSS variables can help us with these crazy, complicated grid declarations. If I want to, if I want to update any of these um, grid template columns and grid template rows properties, um, then I basically need to write out that whole declaration all over again, uh, which can <laughs> end up getting quite messy in your CSS file, make the code like quite kind of complex to go through and debug. So what I can do is I can define some variables for, in this case, the column width and the gutter width. And what this means is, say, after, after 1,600 pixels, I want to make our columns that bit wider in the central wrapper area, and I also want larger gutters as well. So after 1,600 pixels, I'm changing the, the column width and gutter variables. And then I pass those variables into our grid template columns and our grid, gla grid gap declarations. And that means I don't need to write that media query within the grid component. That's already done for us. I don't need to write that grid declaration all over again. Um, so that's kind of nice. Um, I, I learned this after I built like, you know, a 700-line SAS file for this component. So I kind of wish I'd realized it earlier. <laughs> Another way um, variables can help us is by managing component variants. To use another example, we have this article with a class of grid. We have um, a figure and a div with a class of grid text. So we're ba building basically a simple text and image component. We have our image on the left and text on the right. Um, in the background, um, you can see, hopefully, the um, column outlines, and that's just for illustration purposes. Um, and that also kind of shows what, what I mean with the uh, max, with the min max function and max width wrapper. Those two columns either side will be expanding to fill all the available space in the viewport, um, and the central columns will stay as a max width. So that's our grid declaration. It's a bit like the one we saw previously, except a little bit simpler. We only have 12 columns for one thing, which is a lot nicer. Um, and I'm naming a couple of grid lines. I'm naming the start and end lines, and also um, the wrapper start and wrapper end lines so that we can place things on that max width wrapper. Oop. And this is how I'm placing my, com my child items on that grid. Uh, so I'm using a mixture of line names and numbers um, and the span keyword. And the reason I'm using the span keyword for our text um, element is because it, in my component variants, which we'll see in a moment, um, I, want, like, I, I want the text block to remain spanning the same number of columns for each one. I want to vary some other stuff, but I want to keep that the same. And that's a really good way of making sure that you know, you're like when you're placing things by start line and end line, it can sometimes get a bit confusing as to, you know, do I need to place it on this line or that line, but I want this to be the same as the previous thing. Uh, span keeps that a bit cleaner because I know that I always want it to span for regardless of where I position it. So these are our different component variants that I want to build, the different layouts. Um, so the first one is the same as the layout we've already built, and then we have three different variants. I'm using the same underlying grid and most of the same CSS, but I just want to place the items on the grid slightly differently. So what I can do here is I can use variables um, for the grid column property on each of these um, grid items. So, the, so for the image, I want it to start at the image start value, but if that can't be found, then I want it to start at wrapper start and spanning whatever the image span value is, but if not, start at six, 
and I'm doing a, a similar thing with the text component. And this means that if I don't declare any, the, the variables, the defaults will be used, which is the values that we had in our initial component. Then to create those different variants, all I need to do is update the variables. Uh, so the um, so grid C, the last one, I, d I actually don't need to change, I only need to change the image span variable because everything else is, being, is the same. It's just going to be like a narrower image or wider, I can't remember. Um, so I think that's a quite nice way of managing variants. It means that we can keep our grid code a little bit cleaner. Um, and it means we can avoid using descendant selectors or creating new classes um, for styling our grids. We can just pass the variable in, or declare the variable at the component level, and it will be scoped to that component. And this is quite a simple example, uh, so it doesn't save us loads and loads of lines of code, but in my experience, once you've got sort of all the other kind of styling mixed in, and you have like at supports if you want to provide fallbacks for your grid layout, um, then this just really helps to uh, keep the code clean and easy to debug. And I'll just show you a quick demo of these layouts in action, hopefully. That's a different thing. So then we have our four different component variants. And again, there'll be a link to this demo on the slide, so you can dig into the code if you want to. There we go. So just one more thing I want to talk about is CSS variables and JavaScript. Um, and, that, and updating CSS variables with JavaScript um, allows us some quite interesting creative possibilities. To get the property value, we use get computed style and get property value and, the, and your variable name. And that returns a string, is one thing to mention. Um, so for the demo I'm about to show you, I'm actually converting that to a number um, or to an integer in order to perform calculations on it. And to set the property values, element, style, and set property, and your variable name and the value you want to set it to. Um, so it's not a million miles away from any other CSS property. Uh, so I'm just going to show you this quick demo. Not that one. So this is a CSS grid um, background generator that I made specifically with the purpose of creating some nice backgrounds for my slides. So when you click the Generate Layout button, it, the, var the variables for each of those child items, the uh, start line and the span um, values, will be updated with a random number. So we're just going to keep getting random layouts. I'm also using variables for the CSS blur filter. So they'll all be blurred to a different degree. And if you can hit color shuffle, then you can just cha change up the gradient randomly. And that's, that's generating random variables for the um, hue in the HSL color function in my linear gradient. Um, so in this demo, the code on, in the code on the side, you can see as I, I mean, you probably can't see from there, but it, I'll send you the link anyway. Um, so the code on the side is showing us what those computed variables are going to be um, each time I change them. So just to wrap up, if you're interested in knowing more about CSS Grid, um, here are some links to some really great resources. Um, Rachel, Andrew, and Jen Simmons are like the, the CSS Grid people and have written and talked about like everything to do with CSS Grid. So anything they make, I thoroughly recommend. Um, Rachel, Andrew has this Grid by Example, which has um, a lot of articles and um, examples of layouts you can build with Grid. And Jen Simmons has the Layoutland um, YouTube channel, um, which goes into like, lots of different aspects of CSS layout. Um, MDN is full of great resources 
as well. And my own blog, um, CSS in Real Life, I have some articles um, about CSS Grid and specifically um, using variables and the um, min-max function that I talked about earlier, if you want to have a look at that as well. So that's everything from me. Um, thanks for listening. And here's my Twitters as well. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> um, that was absolutely amazing. Uh, I've